And my PowerPoint is not cooperating, so please excuse me for just a quick moment. And let me get that. Um, okay. Here we go. All right. I need some technical assistance. We're not seeing the full screen. How can we do that? I guess I can just quickly scroll up. There we go. All right, so again, good morning. I do want to let everyone know that we will be recording this webinar, as Lydia mentioned earlier. So would love to hear from all of you about your experience, but I'm so happy to be able to present to you the best practice guidelines for California CAPSIs that were developed in collaboration with leaders and cross-sector partners um, throughout the state of California. It's a particular honor to be able to talk about California CAPSIs today in light of the fact that quite a few California CAP CAPSIs have been around for 50 years or more. And it's those California CAPSIs that really served as the model for child abuse prevention councils nationwide. And so in a moment, I'm going to ask Mara Sinio to share with you the vision of the Office of Child Abuse Prevention around California CAPSIs. But I do want to pause for just a brief moment and say that I'd like all of us to extend our thoughts to our fellow Californians who are either vulnerable from hardship or weather related or fires at the moment. We have such a broad community and California has certainly stepped up in a beautiful way to support one another. So even as we embark on this work, we take a moment to pause and to send out our best thoughts and wishes and prayers for those in need of it right now. So Mara Sinio is the manager of the Family and Community Support Unit of the Office of Child Abuse Prevention, which is part of the California Department of Social Services. So Mara, would you share with us the vision of OCAP? Hi, good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Lori, nod your head if it's, yes. if it's working okay. <laughs> um, it's nice to be here with you all today. I hope you're all having a good Tuesday. Um, so my name is Mara Sinio, as, Laura, as Lori said, and I am one of the managers in the Office of Child Abuse Prevention with the Department of Social Services. And I've just been asked to join you today to share a little bit about um, the vision of the OCAP and why we um, worked with Strategies 2.0 to create the document that you're going to learn more about today. So in um, just recently, just this past April, the OCAP released its strategic plan for 2020 to 2025. Um, and within that plan, the OCAP created a new vision for California to achieve an integrated statewide system that supports families to provide safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments for its children. If you haven't seen that strategic plan, you're very welcome to go and view it. It's posted to our OCAP website. To execute the vision, the OCAP is prioritizing the importance of building the capacity of prevention partners, such as yourselves, by sharing best practices and creating a shared prevention agenda. We believe that child abuse prevention councils are key partners in achieving this vision of an integrated system. The OCAP sees CAPSEs as entities that can bring the right players to the table and they can help move towards a shared agenda and inspire the community and cross-sector partners to adopt and advocate for a more upstream approach. To do that, the OCAP has frequently partnered with local CAPSEs to support them in their goal to prevent and respond to child abuse and neglect. Um, a couple of different ways that we have gone about trying to support local CAPSEs are through issuing what we've called our Innovative Partnerships grants, series of grants, and those are um, five different grants, grants whose goal, which have the goal of building regional CAPSE coalitions to grow and promote um, 
mutual interests among those CAPC collaboratives. And then in addition to supporting CAPCs through that stream of grant funding, we also have 23 different counties participating in what we've been calling prevention planning, where child welfare and CAPCs and a variety of other collaborative partners have been working to form partnerships to create cross-sector prevention planning teams. And the purpose of those planning teams is to develop a countywide prevention plan. Um, if you have questions about either of those projects, either the Innovative Partnerships Grant Series or the um, county prevention planning teams, I would be more than happy to answer those for you. So now we've talked a little bit about the OCAP's strategic plan. Um, and now I'll just mention briefly a little bit of history behind the creation of this document. So the OCAP has been aware that some CAPCs have struggled to identify a clear role for themselves within their communities. We sometimes receive questions from CAPC leaders requesting guidance and resources to help them shape their organizational vision and direction. You might be familiar with something the OCAP funded called Vehicles for Change. Vehicles for Change was a monograph that was written to be a resource for California's Family Resource Centers. And this was released um, maybe five years ago or so. After we released that, we felt like in the same vein, a resource needed to be created for our state's CAPCs. So we began working with Strategies 2.0 to develop the best practices guide that you're gonna hear about today. The purpose of the CAPC Best Practices Guide is really just to elaborate and provide clarity on the WIC definitions and share what current CAPCs are implementing to meet those objectives. Our hope is that this guide will encourage unity among CAPCs to achieve a set of common goals to be a catalyst for prevention, a convener of cross-system partners, and a coordinator of countywide prevention activities. And those three goals to be a catalyst, a convener, and a coordinator are um, some of the main points that I know Lori is going to be focusing on today. We think that if California's CAPCs embrace these roles, that primary and secondary prevention efforts will be stronger in their communities and that CAPCs will be able to model not only what effective prevention looks like in our state, but throughout the country. Our hope is that the CAPC Best Practices Guide will be a useful tool for your organization and we welcome your feedback. So please feel free to reach out to Lori or anyone in the Strategies 2.0 team if you would like to get a hold of us at um, the OCAP in order to communicate your feedback or if you have any follow-up questions. Thank you so much for joining today. Thank you so much, Mara. It's always so great and so generous of you to come and give voice to the actual vision of the Office of Child Abuse um, Prevention, giving such um, focused and um, targeted leadership in the area of prevention across the state. So I think knowing the origins, knowing the intent, and knowing how it fits together in an integrated way is so important. So thank you very much for that. So today on this webinar, I would like to, now that you sort of know the history behind it and what led to this project, to give you some of the feedback on the study that we conducted in order to develop and formulate the CAPSI best practices. We'll briefly go over the WIC requirements in terms of current practice and emerging trends. And we will then go into each of the roles that Mara mentioned, the roles and then um, foundational capacity and best practice guidelines and examples. And we'll um, end at the end of our time together with presenting some working tools and resources. And lest you become too comfortable just sort of listening, um, we definitely want to hear from your expertise as well. We have a broad range of folks on this webinar today from CAPSI directors of counties, medium, small, and large throughout the state, child welfare directors, and other cross-sector partners who are so important to the work of countywide integrated child abuse prevention. 
So we did, as Mara mentioned, conduct a study at the request of the Office of Child Abuse Prevention in order to identify the best practices so that we could deeply understand what's already going on on the ground with child abuse prevention councils. What's working, what's not working so well, what are the innovations that are in the work so that we could help really formulate those as a reflection of the field, not only where we are, but where we're going as well. So in order to conduct this study, we looked at the full landscape of California Child Abuse Prevention Councils. As you're seeing um, this map of California, this represents the 22 counties that we interviewed um, to understand their practices, understand their needs, understand their resources. And I think you can see there that there was a broad and diverse representation as well. And we're grateful to all of the CAPSI leaders that contributed to that, many of you who are on the call today. So please do contribute your experience as we go with that. So as a result, we learned a lot about CAPSI structure and governance, about the required and flexible members or membership um, of a CAPSI, we heard a lot about funding best practices, and finally, as I mentioned, the current and evolving practices around implementing and coordinating the WIC Welfare and Institution Code requirements. So I'd like to break each of those down a little bit and just give you some of the insights that we learned. So first of all, in terms of CAPSI structure and governance, there are really two forms of CAPSI, both in the WIC code and well represented in the child and family um, re, uh, review um, manual that are acceptable forms of CAPSI structure and all of the CAPSIs in California conform to this in one form or another. The first form as you see there is as an independent organization within county government. Now that in and of itself is a mouthful and it's also a challenge at times. So what we found is that CAPSIs are very skillfully navigating that ability to be independent and yet be part of the county structure at the same time. So hopefully that will enter into part of our discussion today. The other form of CAPSI structure is to be incorporated as a nonprofit. So many CAPSIs, for examples, for example, are also family resource centers. And so there's a very clear sort of on the ground function there. And again, it's sort of very separate by definition as a 501c3. One of the things that we found in the nonprofit organization of a CAPSI is that relationships with cross system partners, particularly um, those most um, needed who are serving the same children and families to promote wellness and resilience throughout the county. Those relationships really have to be navigated in a very intentional and sustained way. Um, in terms of membership, I think the overarching takeaway message is that per the Welfare and Institutions Code, yes, there are required partners and you see many of them listed there from prevention and treatment services to child welfare services, having the authentic voice of the community and family members as part of the CAPC, probation, family resource centers, public health, and many others. What we found in speaking to CAPSI directors is what was most important was to make the best effort to bring in all of those named and required partners, but also to be mindful and take a look at the work and what is required, which other partners would bring value and add value to the work and create an efficiency for that level of integration that Mara was talking about earlier. So most CAPSIs have each of these members and each CAPSI also has a unique configuration based on their particular vision, the work ahead, 
and the partners um, locally. Next area that I wanted to just sort of set the stage with and reflect the landscape is funding for CAPSIs. And I know this is a big one, and for CAPSIs at times it can feel all consuming, but the goal is to have a plan and best practices that serve you so that sustainable funding is one part and it's in balance with the rest of the work. So here's a few things that we learned from our CAPSI partners. First of all, that the most important best practice around CAPSI funding is relationships. And it's really forming sustained, authentic relationships before there's an opportunity for funding. Probably most of us on this call have been in meetings around a new RFP or a new grant opportunity, and we suddenly see folks that we don't typically see in our regular coordination meetings or other kinds of joint efforts that we're undertaking. So again, what we're saying here is that that relationship component is so important, so much so that partners will pull you into and include you in opportunities that you didn't otherwise know about. So really can't say enough about the quality of relationship and making sure that that's a mindful part of the regular work. A second best practice when it comes to funding for CAPSIs is really making sure that your CAPSI is doing everything it can to be mission driven and to stay on track with the mission. What we're saying here is the opposite is sort of chasing funding and engaging in a bit of mission drift. It may be a great funding opportunity, but not exactly aligned with the mission, but we'll undertake that anyway, and then we're doing different kinds of activities. So the message that we heard repeatedly from CAPSI leaders is, Yes, there were times that we were tempted. Yes, there were times that we considered other opportunities. When we did that, we had to come back to the mission. When we refrained from doing that, we were glad we did because it freed up the opportunity, the energy, the focus to pursue other activities, other funding opportunities that were much more centered on the mission. Thirdly, we heard what I know is familiar to many of you, and that is blend, pool, braid, diversify. Use any of those devices at your disposal to really look at the pool of funding and the pool of opportunity and to build in as much flexibility as you possibly can. Mindful that all of those approaches only stretch the limited dollars so far, but they do help with the flexibility factor. And then finally, and very importantly, when it comes to the area of funding, we heard that it's critically important to track and communicate the data and outcomes, because that's what really makes the case for the good work that you're doing and the innovation that you're bringing. And so having a system, having a pattern where that regularly occurs is a part of the best practice of pursuing sustainable funding. Then, as I mentioned, we also looked at the WIC requirements. And I know we've posted this resource, the um, CAPSI Best Practice Guide, online today, or you can reach out to me or Michael or Sarah and get the link if you don't already have it. It is posted on the OCAP website and also on Strategies website. In this publication, when you see it, if you um, look for the WIC requirements, you'll see a chart, and you can't read it with me holding it up, but I wanted to point out the centerfold, because what we've done is taken each of the WIC requirements that I'm about to go over and really given you a quote of the code, what the code means in terms of the purpose behind it, what is happening now and what's on the horizon? Where are we seeing emerging practices that are effective, that are leading to better outcomes for children, families, and communities? So we won't go over that in detail 
today, um, but encourage you to look at that on your own. For now, I'd like to briefly just remind everyone or introduce those of you that aren't already aware of what the required activities for CAPSIS are. So first of all, per the Welfare and Institutions Code, all of the CAPSIS are required to provide a forum for interagency coordination, cooperation, um, and that's really where the integrated piece comes. So it's that forum that has an agenda that catalyzes the role of prevention, helps it to be a clear focus, and it's a regular structured opportunity that helps us get to results, but that carves out the process and sets the stage for the relationships in order to get there. CAPSIs are also tasked with promoting public awareness of child abuse and neglect. And what we heard repeatedly from CAPSI leaders is that April Child Abuse Prevention Month is a great focal point for this effort of building public awareness, but it's not sufficient just to focus on April. So it's a round the calendar task and many of our CAPSIs throughout the state are taking this on in very creative ways. And of course the goal here of the public awareness opportunity is that we build partnership with community members, with family members, that it's not just professionals, it's not just paraprofessionals, it's not just the staff at the FRC, it's not just waiting for a referral to the child abuse hotline, but that we all share responsibility for supporting families, for helping to build protective factors, and for building up resiliency and wellness within families and communities. A third requirement of all CAPSIs is to encourage and facilitate training across the board, training related to prevention and intervention. So one of the trainings that CAPSIs are very well known for is hosting, facilitating, conducting mandated reporter training, if you will. And it's great to me that this sits back to back with the building public awareness, because these are two sides of the coin. So it's really advising everyone of what their role and responsibility is, and at the same time expanding that shared responsibility to the public at large, to families and community members. One of the highlights that we heard here about mandated reporter training is that there is a strong commitment to engaging in the style of learning exchange that really helps learning to happen. There was some concern about some of the online approaches that allow someone to sort of mindlessly click through and not really absorb or have that transfer of learning so that they take in the knowledge, their critical thinking is awakened, and they're able to use and to follow those practices throughout the training. So again, I commend you to the guide. There's some very good ideas about um, how to work with that. A fifth area of requirement for CAPSIs is recommending improvement in services for families and even for victims. So that's the language in the code of child abuse and neglect. So what this is really saying is that CAPSIs have a big voice and a very powerful voice to bring forward. And this opens the stage for CAPSIs being at the table and making those recommendations. So there are a number of structures in California already that sort of easily and naturally incorporate that voice, whether it's the citizen review panel or an advisory team, or whether it's the county prevention team that are co-chaired by CAPSIs and child welfare directors. But again, a very big um, opportunity to notice and give voice to those best practices that help us to move forward. And then finally, I think this is subsumed through some of the earlier points as well, to really encourage and facilitate community support. So really wanna emphasize that. So with those WIC code requirements and giving you a little bit more of a grounded understanding of 
what do CAPSIs do anyway and what are they? So as the countywide coordinator of child abuse and neglect activities, those are the kinds of activities that are being coordinated and integrated. So with this, we want to lean into now those CAPSI roles and some of the guidelines for them that Mara mentioned earlier. So in terms of roles, CAPSIs are the catalyst for prevention and wellness. They're the convener of cross-system partners, and they're the coordinator of these activities that we've just reviewed. So we would like to pause here for a moment and ask you who are on this webinar, over the past year, which of these three roles have you or your CAPSI put the most focus on? So this will be a Zoom poll with those three responses. Choose one. So let's launch that poll. Okay, take a moment to enter your response. Okay, we'll leave it open for just another moment for those of you that haven't clicked in yet. Go ahead and enter your response. And we'll end the poll in five, four, three, two, one. All right, so as you're seeing the results there, as I am, far and away coordinator of these activities is getting the priority attention for about half of you followed by convener, bringing people together, and catalyst. So um, thank you. Let's see, we'll stop sharing the results and go back to the PowerPoint. So thank you for that. With that, we want to um, now introduce each of the CAPSI directors and leaders who are invited guests today. You see their names there on the screen. Um, there are other CAPSI leaders on this webinar, as I said, and we invite your comments as well. But I've asked Baljeet and Lisa and Carol to join us today um, representing North and South and the, the voice of small counties to really bring forward um, their experience and the innovation that's happening either within their own county or within their region. Okay, so the first role here, and we're going to break this down now, and I'm, I'm confident that by the time we've said more about this role, you're going to want to lean into this even more and recognize where you have an opportunity to do that. For each of these roles, we have um, laid out what is the foundational capacity, or in other words, what needs to be in place in order to implement the best practice guides um, within that role. So for Catalyst, Catalyst is basically making something happen, making sure it's at the table, um, having a central focus and taking leadership in that around the prevention of child abuse and neglect. And so certainly one of the foundational capacities is leadership. And that really includes the ability to motivate and influence others. It requires a focus on being vision, mission, and values driven, as we talked about before, and also the ability to influence change. Some of the best practices that we talk about in the guide include this building of momentum, Change, as we know, doesn't happen overnight. It happens in incremental steps and it's based on readiness. So how do you assess for readiness? How do you um, assist others to move in that direction? And how do you actually build the momentum? Secondly, sharing ownership and responsibility. Also educating and advocating. 
and then the planning and implementation around catalysts. And I touched on this RPR a few minutes earlier, but I wanted to really backtrack to that to say this is results, process, and relationship. And they say that most people have a primary go-to or a strength in one of those. And so take a moment in the chat box now and think about, are you mostly a results person? You want to get to the bottom line, eye on the prize, you know what needs to be achieved. Or are you primarily a process person? Part of what you find yourself doing is thinking about designing, implementing a way, a method of getting to those results. Or finally, are you primarily a relationship person that your primary interest is, yes, getting to the result and yes, doing it through an efficient process, but making sure that we're paying attention to each other and our partnership along the way. So take a moment and enter into the chat box what your strength is in those three. Thank you. Several of you have weighed in there and no surprise, we have great diversity among us. There is no part of that equation, results, process, relationship that is not represented. And that's a good thing because really they, they all three fit together and they're a part of really implementing any best practice. So for each of these roles, I'm going to um, call on our guest CAPSI leaders to um, make this come alive and to present an example. And so the first um, CAPSI leader I'm going to call on is Carol Carrillo. And Carol is the Executive Director of the Child Abuse Prevention Council of Contra Costa County. And Carol has been in that role since there were 99s, even before the 20s, 2000s. So since 1999, Carol has been that. And even before that, she served for three years on the board of directors for the CAPC. Um, Carol has long standing experience and brings that voice and is very generous in sharing it. So thank you for joining us today, Carol. Tell us how you implement Catalyst. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, everyone, for having me. Um, I'm super excited about the development of the guidelines for CAPSIs. I feel like we, we most, a lot of us have foundations, um, but I think this really helps us build on our foundation and also sort of helps CAPSIs that might be struggling a little bit to build that solid foundation. Um, I'm the executive director for Contra Costa County. We do um, most, if not all, of what has already been um, talked about um, that Lori mentioned, we do parent education, we do mandated reporter trainings, we provide a, a child safety program in schools, we have a parent partner program, youth partner. So we do a lot of the work, but I really wanted to emphasize today with the group about the work that we do with the Greater Bay Area CAPSI. So we are 10 counties, um, child abuse prevention directors, and we meet monthly to really talk about how we can Bay Area wide um, sort of cast our net around um, uh, child abuse prevention and safety. So one of the activities, we do a lot of activities each county does throughout the year around engaging our community and being that catalyst. But one of the things that we do, and we do this a lot in April with other partners, with partners in prevention and other um, Bay Area wide partners and trying to get to engage our community members. Um, we do a lot around mandated reporting. We do a lot of, of education and um, support with providers, but we, we want to make sure we're getting our community members involved. Um, particularly now with COVID-19, we really want our community members, our neighbors, our families to reach out and support each other. Um, and so one of the things we did a year ago um, was develop with our, our with partners in prevention, a bookmark. Um, and it really is just a little guide to the help community members respond to 
a suspected child abuse situation or a situation in which they feel a family or a child might need additional support. So we were able to um, print, I think, almost 10,000 of these bookmarks and distribute them among our county, uh, all of our county um, uh, partners and communities. Um, we partner a lot with schools, so we were able to, you know, get families involved and give them sort of the tools and the resources on how to respond to, to child abuse and how to strengthen their community, how to, to strengthen families. So this was just one example that we chose to share around our role as a catalyst. Um, and so I think the next county we'll hear from is Mariposa and their work around catalysts. Yes, thank you, Carol. And before Balchi comes on, I just want to say a word of introduction here up front. I won't do this every time you share, but I want to introduce each of you the first time. So in a moment, you're going to be hearing from Baljeet Hundal, who is the Division Director of Human Services within the Mariposa County Health and Human Services Agency. And when I saw Baljeet's bio, I have to tell you, I couldn't believe that she wears as many hats as she does. So in her current role, she oversees the public assistance branch, adult and aging branch, and child welfare programs. And for now, because of a vacancy, she's also overseeing behavioral health services. So the great news is, wow, what an opportunity for integration. And the challenging news is, it's a lot of roles to juggle. But I'm really um, deeply grateful to you, Baljeet, for joining us today. So please tell us a little bit about your county and how you fulfill the role of Catalyst. So, Balji, we are not hearing you. Okay, just a sound check. We're not hearing you yet. And you look muted now. You're muted. Try again. There you go. Okay, um, so Lydia, can you reach out to Baljeet and we're going to go ahead and hear from Lisa Frazier and we'll um, come back to you Baljeet once we um, figure out what's happening with your sound there. So um, next we're going to hear from someone I think who is um, certainly no stranger to those of us who have been working in and involved in learning communities and with strategies over the years, Lisa Frazier. And so she has served as the executive director of the Center for Family Strengthening, which is the Child Abuse Prevention Council for San Luis Obispo. And that's nearly as long as Carol since 2001. And Lisa can tell you about how that has grown to the link Family Resource Center and incorporated that and her role with tri-coastal counties as well. So Lisa, would you please share how you are involved in being a catalyst? Thank you, Lori, and thank you uh, to everybody who's joining us on this call today. Um, the role of being a director of a nonprofit called the Child Abuse Prevention Council here in San Luis Obispo County We've taken on many steps to morph ourselves to be relevant to the times. And um, I think what you're seeing in front of you right now is an example of one of those approaches. Um, when I started back in 2001, basically they taught me, the state uh, OCAP taught me how to be a mandated reporter trainer, which was a great launch. Right. At the time, uh, I felt the support of the, uh, the OCAP. What I want to share is that we have focused here in San Luis Obispo County, and I do this in partnership with our colleagues in Ventura County, the um, Partnership for Safe Families, and in Santa Barbara County, the Kids Network. Uh, we have been tethered together for 
over 15 years. And because of that investment provided by OCAB a long time ago, we have maintained our relationships so we can do the process to meet our goals. And this is an example of one of those goals of engaging parents, not so much to engage them, but to develop their leadership styles, uh, to the, develop the uh, skill set of communication and confidence necessary to be part of the child abuse prevention tables and other community tables that are relevant to this, this issue. Um, we really landed on having a, an opportunity to bring in our parent partners and our promotoras um, to do Five Protective Factors Cafe as a way to concretely give them the tools to um, message in their neighborhoods to their community in ways to, to promote the pr primary prevention of, of child abuse. Um, this has been an, an, a journey of learning for me as well as for all of us, but the one thing I wanna share with folks as a, as a catalyst, it takes, it, I had to d d uh, develop my backbone a little bit because I'm a fairly confident person, but when you go before folks who don't, know you or even the issue very well, you have to really have your, your uh, elevator speech together, you have to have your messages together, and that's taking time. But it's because of the support of OCAP and, the, and, and also I wanna just the support of, of the uh, Greater uh, Bay Area Coalition. They really nurtured and mentored me when I started. Um, it was because of that that um, I was able to hang in there and figure this out. So. Being a catalyst is something that's easy to do with parent leaders and parent partners because they're, they, don't, they need that uh, support and guidance. But when you have to go before the Board of Supervisors or some uh, other civic person, you have to you know, structure your, um, your message a little tighter, a little, a little more intentful. And uh, that's something that um, we've had to develop and grow over these last many years. Thanks. Thank you, Lisa. Really appreciate that from you. And, and thank you for your work and all the innovation that you brought forward um, over time. Um, let me check in. Um, when I see Baljeet's camera go on, I will know that she is ready. I know the tech team is working behind the scenes to get her, her sound fixed. So I'm going to keep moving forward. And when Baljeet is ready, we will back up and go over her examples. So the next role that I'd like to talk about is the convener of cross-system partners. And again, we look together at those required and flexible roles. But within the people space, some of the capacity that this requires is seasoned facilitation skills. So bringing people together means that you um, have the skill set that is really required to be able to come together and give folks the sense that the hour or the 90 minutes that they just spent in the forum looking at interagency approaches to child abuse and neglect was worthwhile. And when we say foundational capacity, by the way, this doesn't mean that this is the job description of the CAPSI leader or the CAPSI director only. This is a shared opportunity within the CAPSI. Um, commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion is a critical skill, and again, that's across the board. And then finally, emotional intelligence. Not only being able to manage my own social and emotional space, but also managing that in an equitable and compassionate way with others using trauma-informed care when required. Some of the best practices around being a convener um, is being that neutral party convener, creating the space where people come together in an environment that really maximizes participation. It's helping to facilitate effective working relationships, and so critically, it's lifting the voice of parent and community members. One of the analogies that I like to share with folks is the difference between watching the trailer for a movie and watching the whole movie. If you only watch the trailer, 
you kind of know what it's about, but you really don't have a sense and certainly don't have an experience of it. Similarly, with the voice of parents, community members, families, you need to hear from them directly and often, not just hearing what others have heard from them and working on that, but making sure that their, vo their authentic voice is present and at the table. And then a final best practice that the guidelines booklet points out is recognizing the contributions of others. So um, I'm going to call first on Baljeet. I see that you're ready. Would you please share your example of being a convener and then go ahead and backtrack and share your catalyst example as well? All right, good morning. I'm really hoping that it's working this time. Okay, great. Thank you, <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I oh, totally apologize for that. I'm not technically savvy and I must have clicked something on this sensitive speaker camera thing that they've set me up with. Um, so I'm actually glad that we're starting at the conveyor point because I think that kind of sets up um, how we do things here in Mariposa County. So we are a small county. Actually, I think we're a teeny tiny county. Um, to be considered a small county in California, you have to have a population under 100,000. And in Mariposa County, our population is under 18,000. So I think we're number five in regards to the smallest counties in the state. Um, so one of my roles that, um, that I have here in the county uh, is the child welfare director. And so I do sit on the CAPC board and our CAPC is run by a local nonprofit, Mariposa Safe Families. Um, and the CAPC is made up of community members. Uh, we have faith-based members, part of the CAPC and then county partners, uh, which is myself as the child welfare director. Uh, we have representation from the sheriff and the probation department. I think in a small county, what you tend to find is that you don't have a lot of um, nonprofits, and then obviously we don't have a large population either. Um, and so we have to rely on our county departments to really kind of help um, fulfill these important roles on these various boards and committees throughout the community. Um, now, even with that said, we still have some important partners that are missing from the CAPC, one of which is our one and only school district, which is also the County Office of Ed as well. Uh, so there's no membership currently on the CAPC from that entity. And then also First Five is missing, as well as um, when I was reviewing the slides, I, I saw public health was one of the um, potential partners that could be on a cap seat. So one of the challenges for us here in Mariposa County and here at the agency, Health and Human Services Agency, is that we're considered a super agency. So we have um, all of your human services programs that I oversee, your behavioral health programs and your public health programs. And um, in the last two years, I've kind of really tried to look at who is appropriate to be part of CAPSI, because we also fund the Mariposa, uh, Mariposa Safe uh, Families through OCAP. And so whoever is part of CAPSI is in, ha I have to pick the right people from the agency because in, in, in a sense, they're also overseeing contracts that the agency is providing to the nonprofit that is also running the CAPC. So that eliminates anyone from public health, that eliminates anyone from behavioral health, and really just leaves me on the board um, by myself. Um, so those are definitely some of the struggles of our um, CAPC and, and just trying to make sure that it's uh, got enough membership. And I think one of the things that we have run into then is you have board members that have been on the board for years and years and years. Um, and so the turnover in board members is 
um, it just doesn't happen. And so you kind of get into a stalemate, I think, with what the CAPC is doing year after year and um, the activities and prevention activities that are happening. And um, I think Lori, when we spoke, I definitely highlighted that as one of the concerns for um, us here in Mariposa County. And one of the goals that I'm really looking at is stop doing the cookie cutter prevention activities that I think we've been doing for the last five plus years. I'm moving to do something different. Um, Thank you. And Balji, really appreciate that. And I wonder, just sort of backtracking for half a moment when we we're with you about Catalyst, can you say a little more about how the CAPSI is a catalyst by participating with the CFSR process in your county? So I, you know, I would say that the role of the Catalyst has really fallen on the county. Uh, and really fallen on myself as the child welfare director. And it's one of the struggles that you find in a small county is um, our executive director over uh, Mariposa Safe Families, where the CAPC sits, they've had turnover. And with this turnover, you, it's been a struggle to find a new executive director. And so, um, the catalyst role has really kind of fallen onto me and to help their board, the CAPSI board and the, the nonprofit board, um, get them to come to, you know, we, I've got to get you more involved in the CFSR process. Um, how can you help me with our system improvement plan strategies? And, um, I've really just uh, gotten to a point where I've said, I've got this action step, which was the father engagement program. Is this something that you can take on? Because I really feel it needs to be a, a community-based program versus a county department program. Um, and so they're, they're definitely partners in that. Um, they, we recently have come to an agreement that they are going to hire a consultant to help them and Judy, I know you're on the webinar here, so a shout out to Judy. She is helping me with that. Um, and to really look at, you know, what, what are we doing as a CAPSI? What are we doing uh, for the community with prevention? One of the things I want to note is that in Mariposa County, our population of families and children is not large. Our population of seniors and folks over 60 is much larger. We're at about a 35 to 40% range in that age group. And so um, really helping this board look at, you know, you kind of got to evolve with these new families and these kids. And um, so I'm really hoping the consultant will help get us to that next um, new age of prevention activities and how do you reach communities um, beyond what we've already been doing. Thank you. Thanks very much, Balji. Let's go on to Lisa. Let's hear about how you are a convener. Well, thank you. I love this two set of pictures. This is an example of how we as a region of Ventura and Santa Barbara County and San Luis Obispo County have come together to focus on the um, development of our parent uh, partners, parent leaders, um, promotoras uh, for the, uh, the Spanish-speaking population. Uh, this event uh, allowed us to um, bring all the parent uh, leaders together in one place. Uh, fortunately, we all came together in Santa Barbara. Uh, not a bad assignment living on the central coast like this, but as you can see, uh, the diversity we were being able to develop, and this is just from San Luis Obispo County. I, did, I didn't have the pictures showing Santa Barbara, or uh, Ventura County, but I want you to know that the convening of this, uh, we had strong representation, not just from the identified parent leaders, but uh, from our local Department of Social Services here in San Luis Obispo County. Uh, she was uh, instrumental in bringing in uh, uh, these parents to this, uh, this convening. Um, from that, we continue to build on this relationship with the folks that you see in this picture. This was taken two years ago. And the convening is a critical part to having us come together and share 
not just the messages uh, that we have to share uh, about um, five protective factors, uh, child abuse prevention messaging, but it's building those relationships between these three counties. And that still is our focus at our uh, Coastal Tri-Counties Child Abuse Prevention Coalition. And I apologize for the background noise. I have a busy office here today, so if, I, if, you, if it's hard to hear me, I'm sorry. But um, uh, it's just a wonderful example of how uh, the convening works in our region. Thank you, Lisa. And Carol, tell us about how you are a convener. Well, um, again, I, I just want to mention that each of the 10 Bay Area counties work, you know, individually in their counties as conveners and, um, you know, bringing, bringing partners and community together. Many of us are um, embarking upon the prevention planning um, process. So we are convening those groups in our individual counties. But what I wanted to share today uh, was our effort to um, statewide convene um, CAPSIs together. It was our second time doing this, um, our, uh, organizing this convening, and uh, many of the folks on the call today, I think, participated with us. We held the, the workshop or the convening in Solano County, and um, we had about 38 counties, I believe, represented at the time, um, Angela from the uh, Office of Child Abuse Prevention um, provided a welcome to the, to the CAPSIs. I think at that time she also mentioned the work around developing the best practice guidelines. So folks got it to hear a little bit about how that was being developed. And you know, we're really getting excited about having that, those guidelines available to us. We also did a presentation or had a presentation from Laura Porter, who is from ACE Interface, you know, just again, working with us around ACEs awareness and what we could be doing in our counties around ACEs. Um, Prevent Child Abuse California was represented there. Um, and so we just had um, the opportunity to, again, convene CAPSIs in order for all of us to share what we're doing in our counties. What are our best practices? What are we doing around, um, you know, coordinating with each other? Um, we hope to do this again. Um, you know, our, our plans are, are kind of on hold right now because who knows what, you know, the next year will bring. But once we are able to gather again, I, again, I think we had, well, we had 38 counties represented, but we, but, but those CAPSIs also brought, brought community partners with them. So we had a good 100 or so people, you know, in our, in the meeting, sharing and supporting around child abuse prevention statewide. So it was very well received and, you know, look forward to, to having, being able to do that again in the near future. Thank you, Carol. You know, being a convener certainly has its challenges and joys and opportunities. And I think being in a virtual environment, we're all learning a whole lot that's new and different around how we engage and how we bring people together, whether it's in person, whether it's virtually. So you've heard the examples from three different um, organizations today and there are more in the guidelines. Before we jump off of convener, I do want to pick up on a message from the chat box about really remembering to give voice to tribes and tribal organizations as one of the vital members and vital voices that are among the cross-system partners that we bring together. So um, thank you for making that comment and helping us to uh, be mindful and to be more respectful and inclusive. So thank you for that. All right, we're going to um, quickly move on to the next role here um, and talk about coordinator so that we can move through and preserve time for some of our discussion. So coordinator has gone last because it's probably the role that needs the least um, explanation. There are foundational capacities that you see there that include things like being a dynamic public speaker, um, nurturing common language and shared understanding, and again, back to results process relationship. Um, in terms of best practices, it's really the ability to prioritize 
those WIC activities. Not all counties make every single one of them the largest priority. That's a fit on the local level for what works for you and your context. And so I'd like to call on our three guest CAPSI leaders again to just give a quick word for each of their examples on coordinator. So let's start with you, Lisa. Thank you, Lori. And again, as a coordinating entity for this issue of child abuse prevention, I want to just um, share with everyone that the journey to do this has been an ongoing learning journey. And I didn't come so much with a skill set of knowing about child abuse as much as I did, I knew how to coordinate. With that said, here I am 22 years later and still managing this wonderful sector of the work, all because of the support I have received. And also, I uh, have a dedicated core of board of directors that uh, are along my side, uh, along with me on this on this road. Um, what I want you to know that the coordinating part is a skill set that either you like to do it or you don't. And that's something I, I'm fortunate with that I do like it. And it's always excellent to be able to pull many different people together in different tables for different reasons. I used this picture to demonstrate the outcome of the investment of my time and my energy into this uh, work that has resulted being represented at the Child Abuse Prevention Summit and the multiple different uh, folks, multiple different agencies that are sitting here in this picture and how we carry out into what is a, a wonderful way to um, end my career eventually is to have a solid child abuse prevention um, system or collective um, relationships going forward outside of my board of directors. Um, and again, that requires coordination, coordination, and more coordination. I, th I believe coordination is not just the logistical parts, it's the relational part. If we don't have the relationships, we can't do our process and we can't achieve our goals. So I'm very, very grateful for the partnerships I have. And one of the challenges is that partnerships or relationships change. Not everybody stays in a job as like some of us do, like Carol and I have. <laughs> where we continue to do this work and we love it. And at the same time, those that are in, uh, in the different agencies don't always not just stay with the agency, but they, they take on different uh, roles or different, uh, they get promoted or, or whatever, whatever the role changes all the time. So that is the work. And, uh, so I, just and I have to say that. the pinwheel becomes you. <laughs> so thanks for sharing that glimpse with us. Baljeet. Yes, hi. Um, okay, so our Mariposa Safe Families does all the coordination of child abuse prevention activities in our county. And um, I'm just going to highlight some things as you see on the screen that they've been doing due to COVID. Um, so they've done a lot of stuff on social media. Um, but they've also done some activities through a drive through option. Um, they passed out baskets, uh, folks were allowed to come to the, their office, not leave their car, um, but get um, baskets in April and items of that sort. Um, and then they had a, a barbecue event where they also did that through a drive through option as well. So a lot of, they continue to try and do events that the community has gotten used to that they do. Um, but in a very different format. I'm really glad that they were able to change that very quickly. Um, and then every year they do presentations, not only to our county board of supervisors, but the school district's board of supervisors as well about child abuse and prevention activities that they're doing in the community. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Okay, and let us now hear from Carol. How are you a coordinator? Okay, so again, um, just really focusing on the Greater Bay Area CAPSI Coalition, um, we are we're continuing, to, continuing to provide speaker series, series um, getting um, folks that are experts in the field, you know, sponsoring um, uh, trainings and sort of opening that up. 
Bay Area wide. We share a lot of us. My uh, my county does a uh, coordinates the child death review team. We have a new um, partner in the Bay Area who is starting to get involved in their child death review team. So we're able to provide support, knowledge, and education around what your role is in, as a, a team member in child death review. We as a Bay Area wide um, coalition can write letters to editors, um, you know, trying to raise awareness of child abuse prevention in our communities. And then most recently, we actually developed an, an advocacy platform um, that we not only use mm -hmm. Bay Area wide, but we use um, individually in our counties to again um, coordinate child abuse prevention efforts uh, Bay Area wide as well as in our individual wow. counties. Thank you. Thank you very much. And one thing that I do appreciate very much about the Greater Bay Area Child Abuse Prevention Council is your um, attitude toward open space. So you've made that advocacy platform available for other folks to review um, when you also did um, the publication on the economics of child abuse. Similarly, you made sure that it was brought forward in a form that others could benefit from as well. So many thanks to you for that. So a quick question for everyone listening. You've heard us sort of talk about in more depth and detail catalyst, convener, and coordinator. And I wonder, based on what you've heard so far this morning, which role do you plan to put increased focus on? So this is going to be a Zoom poll. Just pick one. So take a moment to enter your responses. Let's launch that poll. <laughs> okay, responses are still coming in. I'll give it just another few seconds. So four, three, two, one. Let's go ahead and end the poll and see the results. Okay, well, you, you heard a laugh of joy <laughs> or recognition as the poll was taking place because it was upside down from where we started, where you're putting the most emphasis now and what you intend to put increased focus on. So um, thank you for that. I'm hoping that you've heard something this morning that has inspired you and that you'll continue to be inspired as you move through. Um, the best practice guide and review that and keep it a handy um, source. So there are some working tools also that you'll find in the guide just very quickly. Um, you have the full page um, prevention framework put together by the Office of Child Abuse Prevention. And you've also got a one pager on these roles and best practices as we discussed today. We found that that one page infographic is all, all, always an easy way of just quickly communicating. And so Sarah and Michael, why don't you take just a quick moment and tell us about how Strategies TA will be continuing to support CAPSIS. Michael, you're still muted if you can hear. Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and uh, kind of give a little um, intro to this. So as Strategies Technical Assistance, one of our big goals is to provide capacity building and of course that targeted support to counties and prevention networks throughout California. Um, these are just a few of the ways that we hope to do that. Obviously there are many, many more and we hope to be, be very tailored um, to what your groups and counties may need. So I'll just briefly develop or enhance uh, the comprehensive and coordinated cross-sector child abuse prevention planning teams. Um, include or enhance parent and community voice, which is so important. Um, effectively decrease disproportionality. 
um, assess service needs, of course, and measure impact. Michael, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, sure. I think the other thing that we're excited about is that um, we're also helping build the statewide network and the statewide movement for uh, prevention. And we will have resources we had talked about at the top of the call uh, to help folks, more resources to help folks connect with colleagues doing the work. And uh, also, should have mentioned at the top of the call, all of that is thanks to OCAP and the funding and partnership we have with them. Thank you so much, Michael and Sarah. Really appreciate all that you are doing to support CAPSIS along the way. And I think the integration into the um, prevention planning is such a critical and important step. So thank you for that. So now we would like to hear from you all. And there's a few questions that we would put out there. We're curious what it means to you for your CAPSI to be a catalyst. Um, if you're doing something that you haven't already heard, maybe a success or challenge in bringing cross-sector partners together. If you are a cross-sector partner, what you're feeling you can do to support CAPSIs. And then finally, what support do you need besides what we've already um, stated? So I invite you at this time to just pick one of those issues and either put a response in the chat box or raise your hand and we will call on you to be unmuted so that you can share your comment. We'd really love to hear from folks on the call. I see lots of comments coming on the chat box now. Um, I cannot really see the full screen. Does anyone, would anyone like to unmute and make a comment? Ambi and Lydia, let's just go ahead and release um, so that anyone who wants to unmute themselves can do that. And while you're thinking about what your comment You, um, our contact information. Even after this call, feel free to. Uh, lots of folks on the call. We're hearing a little bit of background, but I wanted to share Michael and Sarah's contact as well as mine. So, anyone that would like to follow up, um, please. Go ahead and take a screenshot of that, or maybe we can get you the um, PowerPoint afterwards. But if you'd like to capture the contact information, feel free on that. Okay, so um, anyone else with a comment about what it means to you to be a catalyst? Lori, I see we have a hand up from Jan Bramlett. Okay. Hi. Jan? Hi. Thank you so much for the program today. Um, it comes at a really great time for Humboldt CAPC because uh, we have been uh, really struggling and Michael's very familiar with us. He spent a lot of time with us the last year or two um, trying to find a way. Uh, we're a small county, not as small as Mariposa, but we are um, small. And, you know, everybody in the CAPC organization is wearing many different hats. And it's hard for people to really do what they can. I, I really related um, to um, everything that people said. So I, what I'd like to say about for us, I think we have been trying to formulate uh, a grant application, but really the grant application is helping us get really clear on what needs to be done. And we feel like focusing on um, integrating parent and community voices in our county and raising awareness of uh, ACEs and raising awareness of all the resources that exist in our county because there are tons of things that help parents and families in our county and it's amazing how few people know about those things. So we've decided we're going to focus on um, the project that we're trying to get funded right now is 
Uh, we have a large tribal community to the east. We have um, a very large kind of off the grid, uh, I don't know how to say it, let's say mostly former hippie community in the Southern Humboldt area, who's very, very independent for many years. Um, and then we have the hub that are low, the people, the services and people who are located in the Northern part of the county. And each of these regions have very different approaches to um, serving family needs to um, particularly tribal areas. We don't really know what that, those community members need to articulate their strengths. We need to find out their knowledge base um, and, and Southern Humboldt as well. What, what practices are important for you to support your families to reduce child abuse um, and enhance preventive uh, programs. So what we're thinking of doing is um, a combination of uh, inquiry with these communities where we raise awareness of child abuse prevention and ACEs by asking the community for their input about those issues and their views on those issues. And then capturing the practices that are supportive and helpful from each of those communities, we want to formulate a messaging program that we will then put forth in a campaign that goes for multi years and, you know, like three to five years, something like that. This is very ambitious okay Thank and you, that we would you. then at some point measure the impact hopefully of the use of resources because yep. the use of resources and the um and the attitudes and knowledge of of aces and child abuse prevention and child development practices so that's all really ambitious but we're in the position now where we're honing down the questions and the inquiry design so it's really exciting this is perfect timing for us thank you Thank you, Jan. You sound excited and we're excited for you. So appreciate your sharing your view. Najib, you wanted to make a comment. Can we unmute um, that microphone, please? Raise your hand you. again so we can locate. Yes, please, Najib. All right, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm from Child Welfare Santa Cruz County, and I think just in terms of the discussion questions, one thing I do think that is critically important for um, for us to do in our county is um, have a more active role in institutionalizing or establishing a a uh, position or um, you know agency that really does push and and does the catalyst activities for child abuse prevention. I think, you know, um, it's, it's great that we have um, a, um, you know, uh, our Child Abuse Prevention Council, um, our Children's Network that does a lot of great work. I do feel like there needs to be this kind of focused effort coming from the child welfare and juvenile probation sides to really uh, establish that type of work where, we can address some of those policy things that could be coming at the state or county or federal level, as well as uh, pushing forward, you know, the work that's happening at in different silos um, that are related to prevention. So I think, you know, at least in Santa Cruz, that's something that I want to take back to our CAFSI and, and figure out how do we uh, really strengthen the, the prevention work in our county and bring all these different uh, networks that are working on prevention related items uh, and have more of a kind of a countywide seamless uh, approach to child abuse prevention. Thank you. Thank you very much for bringing the voice of child welfare into our conversation and for your thoughts and ideas around that. And I just want to acknowledge that I'm very well aware of how um, much impacted Santa Cruz County has been of late. And so the CAPSI certainly has a vital role to play, not only in prevention and in times of wellness and resilience, but in times of crisis as you're facing now. So our best thoughts go out to you. Thank you.
So um, thank you for all of you who made comments today, who have been a part of this conversation and the ongoing conversation to follow. Um, we're going to go ahead and wrap up in just a moment here, close the recording and close the webinar. But if there's anyone else that would like to make a comment after, feel free to stay on and we'll hang for a few minutes to have a bit more conversation. So again, the contact information there, and I just want to thank all of you for joining today. And I want to thank you for the very fine work that you do every day. It's not easy to be a leader and a partner with CAPSI sometimes, but it's important and vital work. So thank you for that and all the best going forward. Okay, this is really good news. It tells me that we're all being very contem contemplative, contemplative, thinking about what our next steps are and um, sort of mulling what we've heard and thinking through, how does that translate into practice? And Strategies TA has set up a wonderful um, sort of uh, set of activities that will help you to do that in a systematic way. And I know that you will take this back to your own CAPSI, to your own region, and continue the conversation, continue to think of that, and continue to move it forward. So again, thank you one more time for um, being a part of the work, being a part of this conversation. And please don't hesitate to reach out to me or Michael or Sarah if we can be of further help to you. All the best. And just a quick note, this will be uploaded to the Strategies YouTube channel, so you can look out for that if you needed to look back or you wanted to rewatch any of the information that Lori shared with us today.